Hey all, it's Rick Bassman here for a special edition of Talking Tough. It is a chilly yet beautiful Wednesday night in Southern California. Um, I am hopefully at the tail end of facing a very, very major personal challenge. And at the risk of being cryptic, I'm going to leave it there. Um, we'll talk about it probably next week or the week after or never. Um, suffice to say this, it's, uh, it's one that people might define as big, tough, life-challenging, life-threatening, but my head's in the right place. That's a good thing because of the show that we have for tonight. I, I had a phone conversation last week with a old client and old friend who has become over the years on and off. We lose contact, we gain contact. I would dare say more and more of a friend. And that and that's a cool thing. And I've always for the, for the day I met this guy, I have regarded him as one of the most, and these are words I used to apply to him throughout the years and still would today, cultured, intelligent, um, articulate, uh, introspective even. Uh, we had an hour conversation last week, as I said, first one that in many years that we've had. And I also came away from that conversation thinking, wow, the years have been good to my friend's brain. I mean, this guy is like this newfound maturity and, and way to look at life. Um, I mean, the same ability to articulate, the same like very definitive intelligence that was always present is there and maybe even amplified now, but just this maturity and, and level of happiness was something I was really happy to experience during that call. We finished the call and said, damn, that should have been the podcast, but we weren't ready for it. So. That's all right. Now, let me talk about another guy. This goes back to another old client. Uh, 1998, I think it was, we were first introduced. This guy at the time when Japan was on fire before UFC owned the world of mixed martial arts, Japan was the it destination. This guy was on top at Pride, which was the it company. It was ap I wouldn't say arguably, but absolutely regarded as the number one MMA heavyweight fighter in the world at that time. And not many people will ever be able to claim that distinction. Um, and then went over to Abu Dhabi and just owned the submission division three years running. Pretty amazing accomplishment at the time. This guy was absolutely jacked out of his gills. Some would say, and I'll say it affectionately, maybe a little out there <laughs> at that time. Um crazy. All right. I said it. Um, and uh, he, he'd go variably by the nicknames, uh, the specimen, and then became very famous, maybe not for the right reasons or all the right reasons. And we'll talk about this tonight as the smashing machine. So this is a little weird intro and I wing it as I always do. This crazy smashing machine, this incredibly cultured intellect, intellectual, and now I think very, very mature person. It's the same guy. You wouldn't think that. How could this all that be contained in the same person? Well, I'm glad to say from my estimation it is. And I'm glad to reintroduce uh, to myself. And I don't really need to reintroduce to the world. This guy is very famous. Uh, he's a legend, an icon from the sport of mixed martial arts. And as we'll talk a little about today, get about to really um, make an indelible print in the much bigger world of entertainment in general. My old client my longtime friend, none other than the specimen, the smashing machine, Mark Kerr. Hey, Rick, that's uh, wow. That's an incredible introduction, man. I really, um, that's amazing. It, you know what? It, our, our relationship has grown into more of a friendship, you know, o over, over the years. Um, and I usually define a friendship as when, you know, I could pick the phone up, not having talked to this person in a significant amount of time. And you just seem to pick up where you left off from the last conversation. And, 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 you know, that's the beauty of, uh, connection, you know, having the ability to connect, uh, with another human being on a couple, on a lot of different levels, you know, and it, and, um, you know, that's at one of those where, you know, it's, 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 it's easy to pick those up when you have that connection. And so, you know, I appreciate the introduction and, um, 
all the accolades and everything that go with it. So. That, Mark. Well, in the immortal words of Jim Morrison, what a long, strange trip it's been. Oh, man. It has been, you know, and part of it is that I don't, you know, I could pick up pen and paper and I couldn't write this story. I, I couldn't, I couldn't write it because no one would believe it. Like if I said, this is a nonfiction story and I wrote it, people go like, yeah, right. You know, it, it's had, it's had, um, some incredibly complex emotional times for me, you know, some incredibly unbelievable highs. Um, it's had a lot of really hard learning lessons. Um, you know, unavoidably, it's either, you know, either all those things are going to destroy me or they were going to make me better. So were, were there times in your life where you would categor categorically say it did the former? It destroyed you and, yeah. you, and you thought it was over? Yeah. You know, I, I would. Um, you know, when, and this is just really interesting, the timing of this and, and what we're talking about. Um, I just almost finished a book called Strength to Strength. And it, and it talks about um, in life, these high achievers, you know, like if you're a Silicon Valley, you know, um, whiz kid, you know, in your 20s, your brain has, um, it's called fluid intelligence, right? It has the ability to adapt and mold or look at all of this uh, stuff that's been created and condense it and solidify it and make it your own. But as you get older, you have something called uh, crystal intelligence. And, and your intelligence kind of crystallizes into this, into this different level of intelligence. And those gaps between the two usually set you up for when you're in fluid intelligence to have this really high achievement. And then as your intelligence goes into a different format of crystal intelligence. So, you know, understanding that in my brain now, understanding that back then my life was so wrapped up into one thing. I had the fluid intelligence to compete in mixed martial arts and wrestling and, you know, all these different formats to be able to create that kind of life. And I didn't understand as, as I was evolving and changing into my brain was changing into something different. I didn't know how to evolve and change, you know? And so those things at the time felt like they were destroying me, you know, a lot of them self-inflicted. You know, a lot of things that I did, um, you know, looking back on it, you know, you hear the term a lot like self-medicate, right? Oh, yeah. Um, like, oh, you know, it's, well, you know, realistically, I was trying to find, you know, your body is designed to find like homeostasis, right? It's trying to find its, its, its balance point. It's trying to find its equilibrium. And it's like, if you're so far off kilter one way or the other, you're going to try whatever you can to feel that sense of normal. So I think a lot of that, um, you know, relationship wise, career wise, you know, a lot of the things that were going on at the time and it, it felt like it was like 10 deaths when all that stuff would hit you at once. It, it was crazy freaking times. Mark, I remember like our origin story, if you will, was um, in partnership uh at my pro wrestling school at a gym in Los Angeles called R1, the Raw Center, yep. we called it the time. Yep. One of, uh, run by, in my mind, one of the absolute true pioneers and good guys of mixed martial arts, a guy named Rico Ciparelli, uh, NCAA champion himself, I believe, and hell yep. of an instructor and yep. hell of a business guy. You would never know about how he dressed and presented himself, but that was just Rico. Um, I remember being approached by Rico one day. And he was such, you know, in many ways, kind of like a low key, chill guy. And I was managing Oleg Tektarov at that time. He was my first, you know, name guy that I represented in mixed martial arts. Had a relationship with Rico. And he goes, Rick, I'm, I may have something for you. But and as I remember it, at least, he said, but it might be one of those, like, be careful what you wish for situations here. He goes, I am like trying to manage these two guys. You know, they're arguably the top two heavyweights in the world. He goes, I can't handle them, man. <laughs> goes, I mean, what was going on there? I mean, what, why, what, oh, would, man. Like, and other guy, of course, is Mark Coleman. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. You know what? It was Rico, and I believe his brother's name is Lou. Yep. Lou and Rico Chipparelli. Yep. And, you know, R- Rico was a little bit older than me, and he had wrestled at Iowa. Um, you know what's crazy about it is they were trying to bring something into life that didn't exist. Uh-huh. So, yeah, so, all so before, it was all before our time back in those days. Oh yes. my God, man. No, nobody, nobody understood even the, they couldn't understand even the basic, like I, I, I've done interviews before where I've said like, you're explaining this to somebody and they go, hang on a second. You do what? Hang, oh, hang on. Then, yeah. Right? Like, like nobody had a real idea. So for somebody to come up with, like, hey, man, we need to take these guys and present them to X, Y, and Z or get them this, that. Because at, at the time, also, um, nobody really knew what their value was. You know, oh, you didn't know. West, man. Yeah, absolutely. You didn't know if you're worth half a million dollars a fight, a million dollars a fight. Mm-hmm. You didn't know. You know, you just kind of threw a number out there. And if if that's what the promoter felt, like in Japan, you could get some ridiculous money back then. Um, Remember the deal we did with Pride, which was, I think, the first. <coughs> and we don't need to get into numbers and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other business. But it was a good contract. And it was a hell of a monthly number, of paid monthly, if you remember that. And yeah, that, absolutely. To me, that kind of deal felt pretty good back then. But oh, it was like it was like shooting in the dark, trying to figure out. Like when Coleman, late the next year, went over and did that fight with yeah uh, yeah the Dakota. fight <laughs> yeah the weird is making numbers up it was uh it was pretty wild times yeah man. you know Rick, i know i you know i don't think you know the general public gets an idea now um because they because there's enough media information out there now mm-hmm. people can watch your podcast and listen to it and they can hear the behind the story right they, they you know like before this existed, this format, people just still didn't get it. I mean, they still didn't get how how really, like, you were just making it up event by event by event. And what you're talking about, that monthly, for me, it changed my whole entire life. It changed my whole entire life. It gave me stability that I never had, allowed me to concentrate on one thing, you know, on a day-to-day basis uh, to just go, what are you doing today? I'm going to the gym. You know, I'm going to the gym again in the afternoon. I'm going to the gym again at night. You know, I'm not trying to work a job in between going to the gym, work a job, you know, come home, go to the gym. It, it allowed me flexibility and um, allowed me to just pick a spot going, I want to go there. I want to be the number one dude that does this, I'm, I want to go there and allowed me to have the vehicle to do that. You, you were, you know, I think also in all fairness, since we, we've already been very, very honest about everything. And I think we'll probably even go deeper and darker. Um, I, I would dare say back at that time, guys that were built like you and I, had pers- I mean, obviously we were built very differently personality wise. Um, I think if you had, or I had gotten money like you were being paid on a monthly basis, but got it yeah. two or three times a year for one or two or three fights. It'd probably been here today, gone tomorrow. Also, mm-hmm. um, that's just how we lived our lives back then. I think. Oh God, yeah, man. There was, you know, you were spending it like you stole it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, all of it because it just, you know, a lot of that was, you know, there's two, two, there's a dichotomy there. There's the idea in an athlete's mind that you can compete forever. Right. And then there's a scarcity concept of like, you know, Hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to live as hard as I can for as long as I can until it, it's, it's over, you know? Um, you know, and I always had this idea that I could, I could control the ending like a soft landing for my career. Um, and then it just didn't happen. I wanted to you know, ask you about that because, you know, you came in and you started with, uh, 
I, I remember your fights, your tournament at UFC. Was the, like, no, I did uh, Frederico Lependa's event first. Yeah, yeah, you fought in Brazil before that, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And that, that you got, and I'm sorry, and I, and I knew that, of course, but I remember the first time I saw you on TV before I knew you, you were in the eight man, four man tournament. Yeah, yeah, UFC. yeah. I think you fought, this is when it was still like style versus style. And it was like Hawaiian bone breaking versus. <laughs> that, that actually was a style. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't doubt it. It was great they, stuff. I think your first opponent was like special army ranger. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god! It was yeah. like champion of the bear pit. You know, like 14, 18 time champion of the bear pit, and so you know, um, you're standing <laughs> across the, the octagon from that guy. Are you like? worried about these techniques that he might have that he might kill you with? Or are you like, this is ridiculous. I'm going to, I'm going to smash this guy. He, you know, what was still crazy back then, Rick, you still, you still like me, I still had the idea or the concept that I grew up with about fighting. And that was the bigger dude always wins or the, you know, ninth degree black belt guy in Kung Fu, he wins all the time. He's got, he's a ninth degree black belt. Look at his belt. He's got like nine rings around it, right? Yep. So I still had somewhere buried in my head that idea that, um, that shit was true. And so, you know, somewhere in my subconscious that rang, like, it, it's just this little voice, you know, going, Oh, dude, he, he's king of the bear pit. And then all of a sudden, it's like all that shit's just wiped clean because now I'm just, it's, I'm out there doing my thing, right? I'm out there, and it's not I'm out there surviving. I'm out there as a predator, right? I'm oh, out dude, there. You were far, to, from, far from a guy who looked like he was hanging on trying to survive. <laughs> you, you've been steamrolled every day. Yeah. Um, oh, man, it was. It was interesting because looking back on it going, yeah, I mean, that's, it's predatorial response. You know, it's like a survival instinct on, you know, on a lot of stuff, Well, I was on a lot of stuff, but you know, I mean, on a lot of stuff, you and know, you, you ran up an awesome, um, undefeated record for a big, big party or well, long run. In your yeah. Career. Yeah. And then, so Mark, what, at that point, in time, you know, the the viewing audience wasn't that educated. Um, you know, we, we didn't, still didn't know really what submission wrestling was. We did. We mm -hmm. saw it was Bracey. You know, when I say we, I'm talking about the general audience. Yeah, yeah. I knew more because I was in the business, but not that much more. Um, and back then, I think there are guys we would look at. Um, I think maybe Mark Coleman first, and then I think maybe Mark Kerr second. We're like, that guy's unbeatable. And we didn't yeah. really understand the concept back then. And we didn't know that eventually um, John Jones would be beaten. Everybody would be beat eventually. Did you at a certain point ever believe that you were unbeatable? Man, that's that's an interesting question. You know, we're, so in, in the fighter's world, like our conversations, and I think I'm being... I think I'm remembering this correctly. All of that undefeated shit came from uh, Hickson. And Hickson put out there that he was like 400 and oh. Yeah. Right. right. And, and no, no, nobody back then even had any inkling of like, okay, well, are you counting the two fights you had in the sandbox when you're in elementary school? Who was keeping? Are you, the counting, are you counting three the three you had in junior high school, and then the ten fights you had in high school? Are you counting all those? You know, and that's kind of like now I can look at it and have some kind of humor towards it. I have no doubt that Hickson in his day doing submission grappling along with his brother, they're bad motherfuckers. Absolutely. There is no getting around that. The Absolutely. argument just there's no. I can't say one disparaging thing against them. Hoist proved it on a level that Hickson never did. And that's the reality of it. And it's not to say, I mean, Hickson, uh, you know, they're, they're like, I've talked to Hoist since the competition days and he really is an amazing, amazing human being. 
Yeah, very nice, very nice guy. Very un, un, unbelievable, just sincere, genuine. Um, you know, and he he had said like he was never meant to fight. His his father taught them to be teachers, to be teachers of the art, so they can grow the sport. And you know, it just turns out that Hoist is the one that stepped up to to answer the bell when you know, that whole family's kind of integrity was challenged of like, your art ain't what you think it is. And, and Hoist's dad is like, no, it, it is. Yeah. And, and Horion, you know, the, the yeah. business, business line of the brother, he, he told me once, and, and I think I've heard this in other places, that getting getting Hoist out there, and it sound, might sound like we, we may have somewhat different accounts, but I think it's interesting what I'd heard, which was, well, we're going to show that our art is the best in the world because we know it is. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do it against every style, every discipline. We're going to pick big giant guys because the world did think back then the biggest guy was a guy that was going to win um, and the toughest looking guy. And I heard that that Hoist was a strategic selection because he was the guy in the entire family that least looked the part. Where if, <laughs> I you know, heard that part. That's yeah, actually kind, really good. It kind of makes sense if you think about it from a promotion yeah. or, or marketing standpoint, because like I remember, look, I'm gonna sound like some bullshit story of Woodstock, because everybody was at Woodstock, right? I honest to God was at UFC one at Mammoth at, in Denver. And this is 1993. Went with my buddy Jay wow. and the building was half full. And I remember when Ken Shamrock came walking out for the first time. Nobody had ever heard of him yet. I mean, if you're in Japan, you're a hardcore you, fan. You, yeah, you but have. Yeah. Otherwise, I didn't know who he was. But when he came walking out, I'm like, wow, that guy looks the part, right? Dude, when Hoyes came walking out, you're like, who is the skinny, balding dude in the gi, right? Now, Horion, yeah. I mean, uh, um, Hickson would have made a different impression. Because that guy. Hickson was, does look the part. He, he looked like he the does. version of Ken Shamrock. And, he, uh, he, yes, he does. That's interesting because you know what? In all of that, like, um, like in Rio, or then he looks like a. I'm on a surfboard every day, out there. You know, it's just as different. Yeah, you're absolutely, absolutely right. I didn't even, didn't even put all that together till, till you just told me. Yeah. So you put Hoist out there, and then he wins this whole thing. You're like, holy shit. This this is the real deal, right? So, uh, Mark, I, I never do this on the show, but now I have to ask just because it's a fun question. If you fought Hoist in your prime and his prime, what would have happened? Oh, you know, and I think I've I said this. Uh, I don't know if I said it directly to you. So we were inked on paper to fight in Pride Two. Oh no, I didn't know this. No. Yeah. So. Um, so pride, which was KRS back then, mm -hmm. um, they got a hold of me. They said, okay, we're going to pay a, a gazillion dollars, you know, to fight the best people in the world. The first person we want you to fight is Hoist Gracie. So right. I go over to Japan and we do this press conference, all this stuff. Um, and we were inked to fight, uh, God, it would have been March of 1998. Well, how do I never know this before? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, what's even crazier. Um, I'm taking through an old, old hard drive that I had. And I think I found the contract that, wow. that would, that's actually, that would be interesting. If I can find it, I'll send it to you. I'd love to see like, it. Like, absolutely. So, um, so, you know, this topic has come up a couple of times. Uh, God, man, you know what? It, it, I, you know, as a competitor, I'd like to think that I would have won, that that I was so imposing physically, that I would have been able to um, impose my will on him. But watching him fight Sakuraba, and watching just how tough of a competitor he is, you know, it would have been interesting because it, all it would take is one mistake from me. And, and and that's it. It's game over. It, it you would, know. Yeah, it, it's so hard to look back and say what would have happened. And I, I never thought about this question until we started talking. I don't think he would have been able to withstand the assault. 
Um, you're right. If you gave him something, he would have taken it. No doubt. Oh God, yeah, man. I, he's just so slick in being able to, like, if I've, I've watched a ton of his stuff because there was always supposed to be this rematch, and back then it was like acquiring all of it, like VHS tape. You know, like getting a VHS tape and and uh, God, man, it's just you know, it's one of the people that actually. You know, as a competitor, I admired him just because of of his grit. But more than his grit, he was just a technical genius, man. He could, you know, he would work, a, you know, five minutes, four minutes in a round to set up one thing at the very end of the round. Oh, yeah. yeah. And when you, when you would go back and watch the film, you would go like, oh, shit, he's baiting him. And he yep. baits him again, and he baits him again, and then he pulls it, and he baits it. It's just these little things that you go like, you, when you're in the heat of the moment, to be able to have that composure to do that, that's a different kind of competitor. He's playing high level chess. That's oh sure. God, man, it is. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's just one of those things where you know that that whole th whole, um, you know, he shattered the idea that you need to be six foot 10 and 300 pounds, or you have to be, you know, X, Y, or Z or look apart. You know, I mean, it's just really, he, he did a lot, I think for, for the community of mixed martial arts to, to usher them into the 21st century. The Gracie's deserve all the credit for putting in, if not, if not being the ultimate guys that put it on the map, making the largest contribution ever for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll never see that fight. It's fun to think about. Um, but regardless, so you get through your, your steamrolling appointment, uh, opponents. You're at the top of the game. You're ranked number one in the world. You win Abu Dhabi's three years in a row, I think. It yeah. The guy with no submission background, by the way. <laughs> I'll, I'll, let's not forget that. Um so, Mark, what what happens, man? We got to get into this. So, uh, there's there's a very famous movie, and the people, well, people haven't heard of it. It's not famous to them, but I'm telling the people it's famous. It's called The Smashing Machine, and it was a highly, highly regarded documentary that ran initially, I think, on HBO, and was yeah. so well received. It ran like a zillion times after that. Um, you can still still watch it, and you know, it's it it's a deep dark no holes barred look into the specimen's descent into hell. I think that's a fair yeah. Bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I remember yeah. For my part in San Clemente when I lived, uh, if you remember my wife, Gabrielle, we yeah. had a, an apartment at Seacrest Apartments. That was big high Wheeler dealer. <laughs> I was living in the apartment at the time. And I remember renting another apartment in that community which um, from time to time, what? you and Mark Coleman, and Mark. On yeah. Howard, which they had together. Yeah. And, and and if memory serves, and I could be wrong, and correct me if your recollection is different. To me, that was kind of like the beginning of the content that would later become the Smashing Machine. You know, a, a lot a lot of it was, um, you know, I think, I think at the time, you know, looking back on it, um, you know, I, I was starting to place, you know, just this enormous amount of pressure on myself. Um, and I think a lot of it, you know, bringing up Hickson earlier was the idea, you know, like, you know, being undefeated, you know, not having a loss. Um, you know, that was kind of the standard back then. And, and it so, was so unrealistic. You know, it's like, it's like the downward pressure on women to be these stick figures and, you know, to be, it's like the same kind of concept back then because Hicks has said I'm 400 and 0, you know, and he just threw that out there and it's like, oh shit, well shit, I need to be undefeated. And it's like, it just doesn't happen. You know, it's like, and as more money started to come into the sport the likelihood of that happening was less and less because more money attracts more talent. Yep. Obviously. And when you get more talent in there, you're going to have a, you're going to have one day where you're just not up to the challenge. And that talent pool grew fast and emerged. Uh, and but Mark, you know, I, I got to think your, your first, 
I believe your first loss was to was to Fujita in Japan. And yep. Fujita was a tough son of a bitch, man. Um, maybe kind of, and I just thought of this for the first time, maybe in some ways, like, just like Hickson is a Brazilian version of Ken Shamrock or vice versa, maybe you and Fujita were almost like mirror versions of each other. He being like the Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. Way. Oh, God, yeah. Looking but, back on it, he, he was almost like uh, – um, you know, it's hard to call him a plant, you know, like, like put in there as being the disruptor, but he was put in there to be the disruptor, okay. you know, and, you know, he, looking back on it, he actually has a had really good wrestling career, you yeah. know, at a very high level. Yeah. So he, you know, part of what my secret sauce back then was in starting mixed martial arts was that I had an Olympic level training mentality and that's a world-class training mentality because of my wrestling background when you come from a pure mixed martial arts background and it's not k1 and it's not a muay thai right you don't have the you don't have the um class of athletes that that train at that world-class level and now you do all the way across the board back then yeah, back then. So if you go through, you know, uh, college wrestling and then go from that to senior freestyle Olympic style wrestling, it gives you a level because you're exposed to other competitors around the world that train at yes. very high levels. Yes. So you understand what it is to compete at that high level. Back then, you had um, you had these pockets of athletes that understood it. This is a good example. Frank Shamrock. Right. Frank Shamrock comes from that. But he was a mad scientist when it came oh, to yeah. training. Yeah, he was. When it, yeah. Oh, my God. When it came to these little like he was doing heart rate training back then, he was doing heart rate recovery, he's doing time recovery, he's doing these circuits. And, it, you know, 20, 25 years ago, there's nobody on the planet doing that. No, nobody was doing that. Mark, the first guy I brought into MMA that I managed for a fight in corner four was Randy Couture's first opponent ever. Um Big giant pro wrestler who dubiously was also the the heavyweight champion of Finland in boxing, which probably wasn't worth a whole lot. And <sighs> this guy's a six foot five inch, three hundred pound, jacked up, scarred, tattooed, flipping monster. Randy was terrified. He'll admit to that. <laughs> and th this guy trained like thirty minutes in total for the entire fight, and it was just. And Randy ate his lunch in no time at all. It's like, oh my god! You really see that these days? It doesn't work that way anymore. No, oh my god! It doesn't work that way. You know, so, so you know, back then it was you know first loss to Fujita. You know, he understood um, what it was like to compete at that high level. So in in that bout, there were so many other things going on at that time. There there was, you know, there's no, never an excuse for losing. You know, I mean, I would step up and say I lost, man. He he just, he, you know, it, it's hard as a, as a person to go, he kicked my ass. Well, my, my big question for that fight is, did he win that fight or did you lose that fight? I lost that fight. That's I, what I, I, that's what I thought. Um, you know, you know, I, I would say this, Rick, and I'm sorry to cut you off there, but, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of that is, um, you know, as far as just if you go athlete to athlete, right, I'm a better athlete, right? I had more MMA experience. I had more ring experience. You know, the one thing that sometimes is unaccountable is determination and grit, Yep. right? Yep. Going, God, man, he's not very talented, but fuck, he's got grit, yep. you know? And sometimes that gets you through. And there's a whole litany of other factors, but, you know, I, you know, that's a fight that I look back and I go, well, you know, Mark and I should have had our day. That would have been fucking phenomenal. You and Coleman. You know, but yeah. And it just, you know, it just didn't happen. It wasn't supposed to happen like that. You know, I, I remember the first fight that I cornered, first time I ever cornered for you and first fight when I was your manager um, was, was Hugo Duarte at. Um, yeah. And he's a respectable guy for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you won, and you won that fight, but you, you didn't do what you did to the uh, the pit fighting army ranger guy. <laughs> um, his, fight, 
it's like it just to me it wasn't you out there anymore if that makes sense and um i'm kind of like wondering if you would agree with that and if so like what was happening um so this is this probably you never heard this part of it so um to that point i had had like three or four fights in a row where i don't even think it went a minute right and uh back then it was these bulletin boards they didn't have really bloggers but you can get on these mma bulletin boards and yep. and i started reading this shit where it's like Oh fuck Kerr, he's so juiced up, he can't go more than a minute. That's why he's you know trying to knock everyone out in the first 30 seconds, blah 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 blah. Yeah, because everybody so, wants to fight longer than they need to, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so so I end up getting in this conversation after the fight. And if you remember, boss was also in the corner and he was pissed. I, he I was frustrated. He was he was going nuts in the corner. I remember well. Yeah. And in part of that was just he was like just end it. Yeah. And I and I think Rick part of part of that sickness is listening to the clippings or the you know bulletin board material and going out there and going, I'm just I'm gonna beat you until you fucking quit. Oh. Instead of choking you out, instead of you know doing X Y and Z, I'm just gonna keep beating on you. And I don't care if it takes 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I'll, I'll just get, and I think part of that was like, once I got past like the 10 minute part, and then it was like 15 minutes. Cause I think the bout went like 20, 18 minutes or something like that. Long, yeah. And it was so fucking long. And boss was just like, like you could have jumped on his back and choked him out. You could have done this, 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 and this. And it just, he was frustrated. <laughs> Really frustrated. <laughs> I remember a few times boss was frustrated back in those days. Yeah. Yeah. Jiu-jitsu days. I mean, you you were um you were you were always a guy that I talked about during the intro. Um, you know, in, in, intelligent, charming, and I forgot to mention truly one of the most genuinely nice guys. <laughs> but, but dude, you weren't you weren't the easiest guy. Not that I was either. You weren't the easiest no. guy to connect with. No, you, you know what, Rick, man, part part of um you know, part of looking back, um, you know, a lot of it, uh, I think, I think a lot of times it's being difficult just to be difficult, you know? Um, and, you know, I didn't have the experience in that realm of either managing or, um, all the other aspects that come with it. So, you know, I didn't really know what like norms or standards were. Right. And I was trying to create something, you know, like part, like, uh, you know, I tell people, I go, well, you know, my first time ever showing up to Japan for a press conference, everybody's in sweats and I'm in a fucking Hugo Boss suit. Yep. You know, because nice. I wanted to bring something a little different to the table. Hard, hard move, man. Yep. Right. Right. You know, and not really understanding like there's a whole philosophy behind that. Right. Right. No, it's like, yeah, that's all right. That's all right. That's why we have uh, editing software, guys. And, uh, <laughs> as promised or as hoped, we we are we're back. All right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> here we are. Hey, Mark. Good to see you again. Okay. Yeah. Good to be here. So, man, I want to just like with with um, you know, I want to tell you a quick story, and it's going to be one of millions in your life. If you're anything at all like me, you've forgotten a lot of them. So. One night we went to a party. We were at a night at a nightclub on PCH in Laguna Beach. Oh, it was okay. you and I and Mark Coleman and Tom Howard. And then we heard mm -hmm. there was an after hours party in the Laguna Beach Hills in some mansion. Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh my god, it was I think the guy that owned the bars again named like Rizza or something yeah. like that. Yep, Rizza. Yep. That's right. <laughs> so we go to this mansion. And I remember, like, the Ecstasy, X-Tabs came out. I'd never done that. Yeah. Uh, never done one. You guys are in the midst of training for fights. Tom is being Tom, of course, Tom Howard, one of my dearest, yeah. one of my dearest friends. And, and like Boss Rutten at that time and Roddy Piper, God rest Roddy's soul, they were all the kings of excess. Um, none of them are anymore, um, which is great. And <laughs> the, the X-Tabs come out. And I do one and it's like an hour later. I'm like, I don't feel anything. 
and I forget who it was. I think it was probably Tom being Tom. It was Tom. It was like, probably him. He's like, just do another one then. Okay. And, <laughs> and I remember like being carried out of the party eventually by the two top teammates <laughs> in the planet, which was great. Because I couldn't feel my legs. I couldn't walk. <laughs> it was like a typical night back then, man. And it's like. It really was. It's yeah. like, but how, how, what happens in your mind when you're the top heavyweight in the world and then you start to live your life that way? Is there a reason for it? Do you, do you think back on that at all now and go, why did I do that? What was I thinking? I needed to do that to be where I am now. I mean, how, how did that all go? Oh man, um, you know, I, 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 I've obviously examined a lot of parts of 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 my life, and those kinds of instances, um, you know, I really felt this sense of just absolutely two things: um, entitlement, and then just. Um, a sense of immortality where, you know, I just felt like this is who I'm going to be forever. I'm going to do whatever I want to do because I am, you know, you know, I am immortal, you know, this, it, and it's nothing that you really, you form the ideas in your head and your behavior translates that. You know, it's like you don't verbally go, hey, man, I'm immortal and, you know, I'm entitled to this. But in your head, it's this, it's this, like, conversion of, like, that's going on in your head and you translate it into really fucked up behavior. It, it becomes yeah. deeply in, rooted, I'm sure. Oh, my God, man. It's, it's still entitlement still fucks with me to this day. Because I don't get that from you anymore, but go ahead, please. It, no, it's it still does, and it comes up. I'm more uh, cognitively aware of it right now, and in, in how I um, operate. And sometimes it's an attitude. Sometimes it's um, you know in you know the self centeredness, you know, which is just you know again that's part of my disease, right? You know, part of my you know addiction, you know. Um, you know, but it's a lot easier to recognize, you know, when, when back then, when I'm totally entrenched in it, no way. I mean, I am, I am riding this thing until it crashes and usually it crashes pretty spectacularly. Yeah, well, you know, and, and in your case, it was all chronicled on film and for, for yeah. the world to see not many people. Yeah. That. So, yeah. so when the smashing machine and, and I'll just repeat it again for anybody who missed it, I think one way. There's a lot of ways to summarize it. It's a great piece of filmmaking. It's a great documentary. One way to summarize is the number one fighter in the world, Mark Kerr's descent into hell. I think that's a fair way to look at it. Wow. Did you know that's what it was when it was being made? Well, this gives you another another um, layer to what I just said. Uh, when you're in entitlement in the sense of immortality, what it creates is this, is this self-delusion. Right. And so delusionally, I thought my world was completely different. So when I got approached by John Greenhelge to he's like, hey, can you get us passes to this event? We're going to come out. We're going to film a little bit. I want to do da, da, da. You know, John, I, I was, John Greenhouse. I'm sorry. That's the producer. Yes. John Greenhouse. Yeah. He's a producer, and, and John and I went to Syracuse University together. We okay. went to oh, film okay. school there. So you got and so, so he's a little bit younger than me. I was a little bit older than him. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, you know, college wrestling team is just a small group of guys, yeah. right? So, I mean, we all knew each other. And so when John approached me, I had a, already a level of trust with him. Sure. Um, you know, but that delusion was running so deep that, that I thought my life was completely different. I was like, sure, come on in, man. This should be great. Wow. And, you know. You thought, of, you thought it'd be something that would make you look even cooler than you already were looking. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> right. So Absolutely. It really, I mean, it was cool in some weird ways, but um, I'm not sure that's how most, any, most I'm sure that's not how your mother would have looked at it. Um, oh no no <laughs> not not even close 
so this comes out and you see the edit. And what are your thoughts when you first see it? And of equal importance, what does your family say to you? Oh my God, man. Um, you know what? The it's one thing, brutal show, man. It really oh is. Oh my God, man. You know, Rick, the, 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 the part about it, you know, which I didn't completely understand. And most people don't, you know, when, when you're either in a drug or alcohol addiction or sex or gambling, or whatever it is. Right. You know, um, you know, another delusion that I had was that I'm doing it to myself how the fuck does it affect you right and that's again this entitlement this delusion of self that <clears throat> if i'm putting something in my body why does it hurt you yeah you know and yep. and it's so this so this you know so what i didn't understand until my family saw this is how many nights they were up because my girlfriend at the time, uh, Dawn in the film had called them to say, he's on another bender. He's on a run. You know, I don't know, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, um, I have no control over him. You know, she called my brother, Michael, you know, who I, I respect tremendously and has been there through thick and thin, um, uh, my whole entire career. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I didn't understand that. I would get a call from him going, Hey, what's going on? You know, just as a check-in because he didn't know how to handle it either. And he didn't want to scare me further down the road by going, you motherfucker, man, you better stop. Or I'm coming out there and fucking da, 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 da. So he didn't know how to handle it. And obviously it, that in and of itself reinforced the delusion of what the fuck, you know? So there was a lot of deep stuff going on back then. And part of that, um, you know, when all this stuff started coming out and, and really, really trying to get down to like, what is going on? Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tough ask, especially, at, you know, where you, where I was in my career, you know, what was going on, um, in the amount of tension you know, I'd look at it like this to the, when the film came out, Back then, HBO, they were gods. Like, if it came out on HBO, man, it was like the gold, gold, gold standard. A very big deal, yes. Oh, my God, man. It, it's not like you're in the corner porno shop, you, you know, fucking in the seedy side of town. This is on 44th Avenues of the America, HBO building, you know, top floors, two huge freaking cinemas up there. I mean, it is as big time as big time gets. So when this comes out, there's no social media, there's no Instagram, there's no Facebook, there's no, you know, there's none of the, this is it. So this is the first transition that people could actually you know, from this little pocket MMA world to mainstream media, HBO, they look at it and, you know, for a lot of people, they look at it and go, oh my God, I can't watch. But for some people that watch that first 10, 15 minutes, they couldn't take their eyes off. Of sure. It. Well, it's like a, it, it's like you can't look away from a train wreck. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it, it's it, it, I'm sorry. It's fascinating. It absolutely is fascinating. No, it was a, it was a full on train wreck, Rick, man. It, it had bodies flying out everywhere. I mean, you know, you know, and it. You said something I never thought of before, which was that was probably the first major mainstream media exposure for mixed martial arts. Did what? I never thought about that before? Did you take any heat from like Pride from UFC? Um, oh, UFC, I did. Oh, my God, man. So if you want to look at overlap, um, Bob Meyerwitz was having a complete fire sale when he knew it It literally he had pissed every boxing commission off in the United States. Yep. It had narrowed it down to where he was legally allowed to do it in a couple places, and that was it, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so John uh, Greenheld and John Himes 
uh, they approach the UFC and the UFC is like, all right, you want to buy footage? Sure. How much footage you want to buy? <laughs> and so they sold them all this footage at fire sale prices. And that's how we were able to get the footage from the UFC pride. The, the, so this is what's crazy about pride in John Greenhelge reminded me of this, that when they went over and filmed the Volchanchin fight where he illegally need me in the head yep. and it was a DQ, mm-hmm. um, it was a no contest. Um, they never got pride to sign releases. So all of that footage they captured, they couldn't use. So um, as it, as this started progressing down the road and they realized, Oh my God, man, we don't have a film. If we don't have that footage, obviously they ended up coming to me. And I said, you know, what's interesting. I have a contract renewal coming up and I'm going to tell pride. I won't sign it. Unless they sign sure. the releases. Sure. And uh, and I had totally forgot about it. And, and literally, I presented it to them. They hemmed and hawed and were like, ah, because they didn't know what kind of film was going to be made. Right? And I'm going to circle this back to the UFC. Mm-hmm. So, Pride signs off on it. And the film gets made. HBO buys it. Um, at the same time, the Fertitta brothers bought the UFC from Bob Meyerwitz. Oh boy. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dana White gets an idea. He hears about this film and he calls or has the Fertitta brothers, whoever call HBO and say, Hey, uh, we realized that the film's being made. You know, it has footage, all the documents, everything was signed. We legally had the footage. They couldn't protest. They couldn't f- take it to court. They couldn't put a cease and desist. They couldn't do any of that. Plus, you wouldn't want to do that to HBO. It just would be it would be the wrong way to start a company. To, so they said, "Hey, can we get a copy of it to see how this is going to air?" Oh boy. Right. And, and you know what HBO said? It comes out on January 22nd. You, you can that. yep, you can watch it just like everybody else when it comes out. <laughs> and to say that to, to Dana White or to say that to the Vertita brothers, who probably at the time weren't really used to hearing a bunch of no's, I would I would probably venture to guess. Um, so that set a very, very fucked up tone. And then with the UFC, they asked me to fight uh, Pete Williams. And I said, no, I'm under contract with the Japanese. And that's the last time they entertained, offered, looked at, talked to me, anything. That was Do you have a relationship with, uh, with Dana at all these days? No. Uh-uh. No. I mean, you know, it's no reason to, unless he puts you in the Hall of Fame, of course, which will happen at one point. Yeah, uh, it's just, you know what? It's it's one of those uh, conversations that you have where um, the, you know, the, the UFC Hall of Fame is, is really the, the MMA Hall of Fame, right? Because it, it's the whole entity, right? It's like trying to understand, like, um, can the story of MMA be told without this person? That's usually that's usually the criteria. And it and it'll follow the WWE Hall of Fame by the same token, because for up until 10 years ago, if you weren't a WWF superstar, you weren't going to get into that Hall of Fame. And yeah. now they're realizing they have to put people into it that never even worked for the company because it has become the de facto Hall of Fame for the entire industry. Yeah. UFC is absolutely going that direction. If they're yeah. not there already, so you'll, you'll have to be in. Um, well, it's just one where, you know, like for, for me being where I was in mixed martial arts and in, in the UFC and pride and to go over and do Abu Dhabi um, was such a big risk at the time because it could either invalidate me or, oh, he's just, he's a big steroided up dude, man. That's why he's winning these things. Right. You know, or it could absolutely validate me. 
and that was a continuation of like the evolution of understanding that mixed martial arts is really complex, man. It involves so much detail from so many different disciplines. And that's kind of what I was trying to demonstrate at the time going, I have a wrestling background. The, the first thing I knew is that I didn't know how to freaking fight. I, I didn't know how to fight. I know how to compete, you know, at a very high level. I didn't know how to fight. You know how to control so, the body. Yep. And so that was part of the um, Beverly Hills Jiu-Jitsu and Boss Rutan mm-hmm. and uh, Oleg and Marco Huaz and Pedro Hizo and, you know, that whole group of guys. Yeah, and what a crew. Was, wow. What a oh, crew. my God. Can you imagine? Yeah. I mean, can you imagine? Like, Marco at the time didn't speak any English. And I was just joking with Boss about this. I go, um, so, so we would go there, and Marco would want to wrestle. And I wrestled with him all day long. And he had a big then, smile. He had a big kid-like <laughs> smile all the time. Also. He did, man. Such a good person, man. Such a genuinely good person. Um, and so I would say to him in English, when we would spar, I would go, Marco. No headshots because we didn't wear headgear or mouthpieces. We were fucking knuckleheads, right? How about, how about don't kick me in the leg? Also, that was the other one. But he would he would go no he would go shin he would we would I would go I wouldn't spar him without shin pads because the because oh, a couple times I go okay all right he could his timing where he would just kick me off my feet right oh, he yeah. would just kick me off my feet like. Because a lot of, um, like with Boss and with Marco, if you were lazy with anything, they would, like, if you threw a lazy jab against Boss, Boss would just, he'd hit you 10 times. Yep. Like, everything that you did with him had to be, you know, deliberate, willful, intentional, yep. right? You can't just go, like, hey, I'm going to just, you know, because it just would hurt. Um, so with Marco, I'd go, Marco, no headshots. And he'd go, okay, okay, okay. I'd swear, man, like one minute of the round. Pat, pat. Yeah. And then he would try to explain to me, he'd try to explain to me in Portuguese that, hey, it's a reaction. I'm not doing it on purpose. Yeah. You know, yeah. but I didn't understand this till much later. And I go, I, why didn't you just fucking translate that to like, dude, we need to do something different because I'm tired of getting punched in the fucking head. Yeah, wow. those, those were the days, man. Well, Mark, let, let's, um, man, I've kept you for a while, but I'll, a couple more things I wanted to get into before we uh, let you go here. Yeah. Stay, staying in the in the abyss for one more moment only till we really come out of it. Um, so at the end, the, the end of Smashing Machine sees you in a pretty dark place. Um, what, you know, people out there, they want to know this because, you know, fans of mixed martial arts, pro wrestling even that are watching this, they know Mark the Specimen Kerr is, you know, the one-time top heavyweight in the world, a legend, an icon. Um, they've heard some uh, recent amazing news. Um, maybe they've forgotten that you've experienced just as bad as they have, maybe even worse. And people find that relatable, man. They, I, in my experience, the, um, the I don't want to say average, nobody's average, but the citizen, who, the, regu- the regular man, it helps them to know their heroes have been through it too. Um, they, I think people take solace in that and inspiration and coming back out the other side. Is there, like the, if you, there are probably several rock bottoms, I'm sure, but oh, man. How, how would you characterize and describe like the worst of the worst? Where, where were you and what did that look like? Oh man. Uh, you, you know, the, like the, like when when I have a bad day, like now, right? The the thing that pulls me back into, you know, like it's not that bad. Um, and this is hard to admit, and I've only talked about it a couple of times, you know. But you know, back in I think two thousand six, two thousand seven, um, I just got di- divorce is finished. I, my son at the time was probably like two or three. And, um, just, I couldn't stay sober. I could, just couldn't get it together. And, you know, I, I end up literally, um, living out of the back of my fucking car, you know, like literally living out of the back of my car, you know, and, um, it 
that, you know, that is like the, my best thinking at the time, you know, that's where it landed me, you know? Um, and there had, you know, for me, the uh, level of humility to get to where I am now, the amount of work that I've had to do, um, you know, it, it really is, it's humbling because it requires a level of honesty, um, about, about what my defects are, uh, what my attributes are, you know, um, you know, what I can contribute, um, the lessons I could, you know, help somebody with, you know, it's, it's a lot, Rick, man. But I, I just remember, you know, literally, literally, you know, in the back of my car and, and just not having a freaking clue what I was going to do. So it was the opposite of, Hey, I'm in my car. This is so cool. I don't have to feel <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't a, uh, Hey, Oh my God, I'm free. You know, Hey, you know, um, it wasn't a minimalist lifestyle. No, <laughs> By you any probably sense. you didn't have a lot of close contact with your son. I would imagine at that point. No, no. And then really what kind of pulled all this back together, um, was, you know, I, I ended up going up to Colorado for a little bit training up there to try to get ready for an event. And just, I wasn't in a space to be able to train, you know, and I came back down and I'll never forget this. I mean, my son, like I said, was two or three at the time. And, uh, um, I, my ex-wife opens the front door and my son cowers behind her oh, cause God. he, cause he doesn't recognize me. Oh, Right. You know, it had been like seven months, eight months since I'd seen him and he doesn't, he doesn't recognize me. And and it was this feeling, I, the feeling I can pull it up right now and it gets me emotional, you know, cause it's one of those feelings where at that moment I was, you know, I'm never, I'm never going to put him in that spot again. And I'm never going to have this feeling again. Like I've just absolutely just fucking let this kid down, you know? And there's been a lot of moments in between here and there. And, and, you know, my son is, is, uh, 19 now, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, it's turned out to be just an amazing kid. Yeah. I'm sure life looks a whole lot different. I know life is different for you these days. I know that by talking to you last week and today, and I want to, I, I want to, toward the end of this, really get into what your life looks like today, because I, I know it's like the proverbial happy ending that gives <laughs> it's just people hope, but I'll, I'll just yeah. I want to ask you before we get there. And it's this: so many, many years ago, your your old colleague and friend John Greenhouse calls you, a guy maybe that can get a movie made, and says, "Hey, uh, I want to try to make a movie with you." And it happens, and it comes out, and it is what it is, and you know what that movie is now. I think I'm actually going to go watch that again tonight, Mark. I haven't seen that. Oh yet. man, I want to watch. I haven't seen it in 20 years, probably. I really feel like I want to watch it again. Um, so you get it made and, you know, you have the reaction you have, your parents have the reaction they have. Yeah. Your guy, your guy got a movie made. And years later, many years later, um, some other guy calls you that maybe has the ability to get a movie made also and says, yeah. I want to make a movie with you about you. Um, can you tell us what that's about and what's happening with that now? Yeah. So, um, God, man. So I get a call um, from a guy named Brad Slater and Brad Slater works for William Morrison agency. Yeah. Brad Slater, Slater in the world. Oh, he's, he's huge. I mean, you know, so I get a call from him and he says, Hey, uh, Dwayne Johnson, the rock, um, wants to do a biopic movie about your life based on the documentary. Well, hold on. Did you think you were being pranked when you first? Got oh, hundred percent, man. Hundred <laughs> percent, Rick. This is like one of these where it's like, I swear, man. It's like, where's the camera? Like, where's? The, I know there's got to be a camera in there somewhere. You know, just like, like not. And I even looked him up, and I punched the number in the computer. I'm like. Oh shit, the number does go to William Morrison Agency. Well, fuck. So, and for context, for those out there who don't know, because I've been in that industry forever, William Moore, WME, 
Oh. Who owns UFC and WWE? And, yeah. Um, is the number one agency in the world. And Brad Slater is at the top of the heap, what they call a packaging agent, which are the guys that put entire projects together under the William Morris banner. So yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't get higher on the food chain than, than WME or Brad there. So I just no, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's like calling the president, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, um, you know, it, it was like one of those feelings where, you know, when it, when it started, it was like, okay, you know, and, and then from there, the progression of it, um, you know, everything needed to happen the way it happened. So when this started back like four years ago, you know, I, I didn't even get excited about it, Rick. I just kind of tried to stay between here and here. Right. I just said, kind of like my life needs to go on regardless, Good. you know, if this happens or doesn't happen. And I still have that kind of sense of feeling, Good. but the, di the difference is now everything's in place. Now, yeah, now it's green lit. It's happening. Oh my God, man. It's, it's so everything's in place back then. He had an idea. So DJ DJ had an idea and he didn't have all the pieces worked out. And so now everything just kind of fell into place. It's like, you know, A24 Studios, Benny Safi's directing it. Benny Safi's writing it with DJ and, you know, seven bucks is going to produce it. You know, A24 is a studio that's, you know, going to, I mean, it's, it's turned into where, it's like, oh, shit, this is going to happen. Well, Mark, and for those out there listening that don't know, who's playing Mark Kerr in the movie? Uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. <laughs> that, that's insane, man. Yeah. So, um... <laughs> you know, you ever, you ever sit around? This is what's funny. So this is a running joke for a while, Rick. Hey, hey, oh, they're going to make a movie about your life. Who's playing you? You know, like, like the game of like, well, if they're going to make a movie about your life, Rick, who, who, who would play you? Well, you Brad, know, or, Brad Pitt, obviously. Of course, you know. And, 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 I don't know what it is. <laughs> exactly. Like, like if I was like, had all the options on the board, I'd go, oh, I'd, I'd probably want the rock to play me, I right. guess, you yeah. know, just, I'm just saying, you know, looks. Build wise, it's just like Fullness. sadly, Mark, yeah. I ended up with Paul Giamatti, but <laughs> um, it's better no, than I, Danny I, DeVito or something, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And but any, anyways, it's just one of those, you know, run one of those, um, you know, amazing things, and you know, a lot of stuff that's gone on in my life, um. You know, a friend had said it to me, and he had said it just, he said it matter-of-factly. He said, you know what? This is what you need to do. You need to go in your bathroom, look yourself in the mirror, tell yourself you love yourself, tell yourself you're worth it, tell yourself you deserve it, and tell yourself that you are just this that's the character of who you are underneath all the fucking bullshit, you know, underneath all the bad behavior, underneath all of that stuff. The reason why this moves forward is because of who you are as a person, you know, and as this amazing context, when he put it in that context, I'm like, wow, you know, like, you know, it makes sense. You know, it makes sense that this is kind of how, things have progressed and where, where I am now. And, you know, when I talk to DJ, he, you know, he's just such a gracious guy and, you know, he's just genuinely such a good person. You know, he's like, Hey Mark, I want you to know this is an honor for me. I don't, I don't think you understand. This is like a really big honor for me. It allows him to move in a direction that he's never moved in before. You know, and I told him, I said, DJ, I think, you know, at this point, I would, I would venture to say that you were made and born for this role, you know, because he identifies with it in a way that he thinks he can bring it to life I can and see that. Certainly. Yeah. In, 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 a, in a way that when you talk to him about it, you can feel the excitement. 
Well, he, he, he's a real guy, you know, for, for a guy oh. who became the top guy in the history of a make-believe world. Well, he, he, be, he became that because he's real. So yep. I, I could absolutely see that and see – I don't know him well. <laughs> you know, I actually uh, – when he came back after uh, many years off to wrestle Hulk Hogan in the main event at WrestleMania, I got a call from the head of WWE Talent Relations going, hey, The Rock's coming back. He's got ring rust. Can you bring him into your gym and kind of like work some of the rust off him? And I'm like, sure, of course. Yeah. So he comes in. It's supposed to be like a week-long deal. I brought all my top instructors in. Tom Howard was there that day, other guys that you know. He came in. And he looked like a million bucks in the first 10 seconds. And I just, all I like it. We had one session, and all I could say is like, "Hey, kid, I think you got." The <laughs> yeah. um, but no, yeah. I, you, you got how real and how how genuine he was, and dude, it's it, it's awesome that you have that relationship with him now, and that you're in this place where the number one movie star in the freaking world is genuinely yeah. excited and humbled by playing you. That's um, but but what I really like about this part, the whole like fan worship part of it aside is I can see like how humbled you, you are by it. And, and, and I love what you said a couple minutes ago when you're talking about, you look yourself in the mirror and say, I love you. And yeah, you it. I do. That's great advice. For, I mean, there's going to be very for many few of us that are going to ever have Dwayne Johnson play them in a movie. Um, <laughs> but that yeah, you said, it applies to everybody in every situation every day. Yeah, and that aside from the part that I'm worshiping the fact that Dwayne Johnson is playing in you in a movie, that's my favorite part of what we talked about tonight. And uh, dude, it's just so cool that that you're in that spot. It's just yeah, it's just, Rick, man. It's you know, and I and I say this with with a lot of humility because it it took a lot of tries, right? And you know, understanding that it took exactly how many tries it needed to be in order for me to get here. Right. It hit not one more, one less, exactly the number that I was supposed to. And it's created, um, you know, nobody can stay in a sense of gratitude 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, but it's easy. It's easy for me to just stop for a minute, even before this, even before this, to have just a sense of gratitude that I don't have to live in my own chaos, that I can actually, you know, bring peace and joy around the people that are around me and understand that my life now is about connection. It's about connecting. It's about, you know, putting myself out there in an honest and genuine way so I can connect you know, that human connection is really what I've been after my whole entire life. You, know, you, have, that under- now, you have that other uh, little Dwayne Johnson movie thing aside. Um, you, your life now, that that characterizes your life. You have that with, with your son, um, yep. with your brother, I would imagine. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and it does, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's that thing that, you know, for me personally, that, you know, fr- like having this, uh, when I was younger, I had this fear. I was afraid to connect on certain levels. So I'd only give you the, the appearance or what I thought you wanted or, you know, all these other things. And, and now I have the sense of comfort in myself that, you know, my, uh, like Jay Glazer is a good friend of mine. And Jay would, you know, he says it all the time. He goes, dude, you know, your vulnerability is your strength. Period. You know, like if you're going to go, you're a superhero, right? You're a superhero. What's your power? Vulnerability. (laughs) You know, it's like counterintuitive, but it's, it's really what allows that connection to happen and allows, um, uh, you know, allows me to be at peace with myself. Mark, that, that, that's amazing. And I'm like, I'm listening to everything you're saying and it's just resonating so strong. I don't know if you can see this obnoxious background I have up on uh, the podcast here. (laughs) <laughs> but this bottom, do you see the bottom uh, yeah. in the red? The world's toughest men and women at their most vulnerable. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that, that's what makes yeah. me real, man. And, you know, it's like, you know, I've kept you so long, and I don't want to keep you. I mean, I'd love to keep the conversation going. But I got it. To your time, it's like, normally I would do, uh, you know, say, hey, Mark, thank you. Then you'd go away, and I'd do a big wrap-up. 
But I don't think there's anything to, to say beyond this, man. And if I did, it's going to weaken what I think. <laughs> so, um, so here's here's for your listeners. This is what I, I'll give. I'll give you this promise, and I'll give them this promise. Yeah, well, so, why don't you take, you take us home, please? Okay, yes. so I'm going to take you home. Okay, so as this movie progresses, um, we're going to have an update. And so this is what I'd really, really, really like to do. I'd like to, when I'm on set, uh, come back on the show um, because I'm going to be an executive producer. I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm going to be there. And I would love to be able to do um, like a pod. You know, I'd like to be able to get back on the show and kind of walk, you know, your listeners through another chapter of this. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. No, it would, it would, oh my God, man. It would be fantastic, man. It would be like really cool. And I, and I think part of it, Rick, and I'm just going to end here. Part of it is just, again, you know, the connection that you and I have and really like I could do a podcast and interview you because there's so many different levels to, you know, really admiring what you've done through the years Um, and the consistency you've been as a person. So I really do admire that and respect that. And I love to be able to take your listeners on set with me, man. Oh, that's good. Thank you so much, Mark, man. I love you, man. It was so great. I love you too, buddy. And signing off for Mark.